Good evening for our Asian audience. Good morning for our audience in North America, and greetings for all other audience. Welcome to the number four, number one session of MIT IOP Regional Webinar Series. My name is Xiang Zhao. I am a Program Director of all Corporation Relations at MIT. MIT Corporate Relations serves as a chief gateway for industry to access to MIT and MIT connected startups. Today, I am your host of this session. As you all know, the COVID-19 has tremendously impacted our daily life and strengthened our sense of living ecologically and energy conservation. Rechargeable energy storage devices especially li rechargeable lithium ion batteries as the core energy conservation system have been the focus of not only bas basic research and also industrial development. As the most deeply, widely studied uh, and uh, utilized rechargeable battery, lithium ion batteries have helped revolutionize many areas such as mobile communication, EVs, energy storage system, and et cetera. Today's session will feature one MIT professor, Mr. The professor Julie, focusing on the research of energy storage and a conversion of, a, of course, including lithium ion battery. Professor Lee will introduce new devel developments in hybrid anion and a cation redox, cathodes, high columbic efficiency liquid electrolytes and uh, metallic foil anodes. Efforts connecting to real engineering challenges, pre, such as the uh, pre-lithiation techniques, electrode compressed density, lean electrolyte and the full cell design, and the issues related to battery management system, safety and recycling for grid scale electrochemical energy storage will be discussed. Professor Lee will talk about about one hour or a little bit, a little bit longer, including Q&A. So please ask questions and also vote on them. Uh, here's the few notes on logistics. For those as a first time participates, in addition to the session today, we will hold a few more sessions on different topics. Webinar series details can be found on our website, ilp.mit.edu. Under the attend and the then webinar tab. All the sessions will be recorded and the recording will be available on the same web page, website. For those Currently, with your comp computer, at the bottom of your screen, you can see several icons. Please use the Q&A icon to ask questions and vote on them. Chat icon is only reserved for technical questions with the organizers. With that, let me introduce our speaker, Professor Julie. He has uh, held faculty positions at uh, Ohio State University before, and also University of Pennsylvania. After that, he came to MIT as a chaired professor. At, um, his group um, uh, investigates the mechanical, electrochemical, and uh, transport behaviors of uh, materials, as, as well as novel means of uh, energy storage and conversion. Professor Lee is a recipient of a 2005 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, 2006 Material Research Society Outstanding Young Investigator Award, and also TR35 Award from a Technical Technological Review. He was elected as a fellow of uh, American Physical Society in 2014 
and a fellow of Material Research Society in 2017. Thomas Rogers and uh, Clary Vatt in, uh, included the June in its uh, highly cited researchers list in 2014, 2018, until 2019 in material science, uh, science category. In 2016, Professor Lee co-founded one of the MIT Energy Initiative, Low Carbon Energy Centers, the Center for Materials in Energy and Extreme Environments. Now, let's welcome Professor Julie. Thank you, Sean. Uh, great pleasure to uh, give a, a corporate seminar here. And I actually see a lot of friends uh, and colleagues uh, in the audience. Uh, appreciate your attendance. Uh, so it's uh, pretty late also uh, in, in uh, the other part of the world. Uh, so uh, let me share screen. Today, I will first go over uh, some of the bigger trend in the lithium ion battery industry. Uh, in particular, uh, I'm very uh, bullish on the uh, storage. Uh, so using lithium ion batteries for uh, electrical grid uh, stabilization and renewable energy storage. And then I will dive a bit deeper into uh, my own uh, group's research. So uh, in uh, 2018, uh, there are already uh, 1 million electric vehicles sold uh, in mainland China, and uh, about a third of that uh, sold in the uh, United States. So that's a, a very big milestone. And the outcome of this big uh, supply chain in the EV industry is in the past eight years, there is a five-fold decrease in the cost of battery cells and also battery packs. So uh, as you can see from uh, this chart, uh, in 2010, uh, it's $1,000 uh, per kilowatt hour uh, in, the, in the system. So this is the, uh, in a kilowatt hour of, of electricity storage. And in eight years, uh, it have gone to uh, less than a fifth of that. And this is according to Bloomberg uh, in 2018. And in the next uh, uh, four years, uh, it's going to uh, expect it to shrink uh, another uh, about 50% uh, again. Um, so uh, this uh, is driving uh, uh, grid scale storage. Uh, as early as uh, 2010, so uh, DOE has made uh, this estimate that uh, once the uh, battery system cost is lower than this magical number, $100 per kilowatt hour, then it's going to uh, enable deployment of renewable energy uh, across uh, uh, many of the uh, our grid uh, uh, business. So, uh, uh, now, however, uh, that's 2010, right? So we are 10 years uh, away from that date and uh, there is inflation. So the newest uh, number uh, that we get is actually $150 per kilowatt hour. So there is a recent very nice paper from uh, Jessica Trensic and Yimin Chan at MIT that uh, did uh, detailed modeling that showed that uh, you can have very deep penetration of the electrical grid uh, at, at, at this kind of uh, system cost, uh, if you have just 5% uh, base load uh, dispatchable generation capacity. So you can replace 95% uh, of the generation by renewable intermittent sources. Uh, and we already have that, right? So we have 20% uh, nuclear uh, stable base load. So that means that uh, as of uh, this year, uh, if we can beat $150, then we should be able to uh, uh, revolutionize the uh, electrical infrastructure. So we're basically here already. Now, uh, there is also another side. So this is the capital expenditure. There's also the issue of uh, the operating costs. And that, and that has to do with the life cycle of the battery systems. So generally for uh, grid scale storage, uh, you need something like 10,000 cycles uh, to make economic sense. However, if you look at the electric vehicle industry uh, in 2016, uh, already uh, uh, there is a, a good technology, for example, from Samsung uh, that can do 7,000 uh, deep uh, charge discharge cycles. 
And uh, so with uh, predeciation technology, uh, you can actually dramatically increase uh, this uh, cycle life. So the technology to get to uh, 20,000 cycles is, is uh, being developed. So my group have done some work in using metallic foils to predict uh, silicon anodes. And, and, and this is definitely doable and, and uh, scalable technology. So these all look uh, very, very good. Uh, but what, what is the showstopper? So uh, as of today, there are two main things. Uh, one is a safety problem. Uh, the other is, is recycling. Uh, recycling and also the same resource. And these two are uh, obviously related. So uh, if you look at uh, uh, South Korea, uh, there was uh, 27 fires uh, in three years. Okay. So this is a list uh, of, of the accidents uh, in USA, China, and, and Korea. And, and, and that obviously is, is not acceptable. That's a big liability cost that you should add uh, to the cost uh, calculations. Uh, okay, let me increase. So can you hear me better now? Okay, so uh, uh, now this uh, 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 fire accidents uh, not only uh, yeah, and not only related to uh, battery cells. A lot, lot of times, actually, it's the uh, uh, power electronics, the cooling system, and also it has a lot to do with the battery management systems. So. Uh, we're doing some work uh, in using new network for health diagnostics. And uh, it's able to do very accurate uh, state of health uh, prediction. For example, using only one cycle uh, of the discharge, we can uh, predict the uh, uh, cell life within about uh, cycles. And we can also predict the uh, discharge curve uh, at the end of life, uh, comparing uh, this new network prediction with uh, actual end of life uh, discharge chargers for a good battery and also for the uh, most degraded battery. So there's a lot that can be done uh, on the battery management uh, side and also on sensors and on safety systems. Uh, okay, there's some complaint of the sun. Uh, yeah, I'm using. Uh, the same sound system. Uh, let me try to restart. Can you hear me better now? Yes. OK, good. Uh, I'll just be closer. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, another issue is uh, lithium resource and uh, recycling. Um, because uh, right now, uh, all lead acid batteries essentially are, are recycled. Uh, but uh, only uh, less than 10% of the lithium ion batteries uh, are currently recycled and they are toxic and uh, they are fire hazards. And also, you live away uh, the existing uh, lithium resource uh, if you just uh, uh, don't recycle lithium batteries. Recycling is a huge problem. And uh, what we have been uh, working on are uh, techniques to look at uh, light repair. So instead of uh, getting the cobalt and getting uh, nickel and lithium out separately, we try to use the microwave method. Uh, so this is a custom uh, microwave uh, system uh, developed in the lab to look at low energy, uh, low environmental impact recycling of the cathode material, especially uh, lithium ion phosphate, where we can recover uh, both the lithium uh, and also uh, we don't, uh, you know, go back to uh, square and we can uh, replenish the lithium resource a little bit. And so depending on uh, the different methods, uh, we can uh, get uh, actually up to 150. Uh, if you look at milliampere hour per gram, if you look at uh, just the active material. So uh, in this case, uh, we still have the same uh, carbon black and 
even the same binder in uh, in in the some of the binders to reside in the system. So this uh, after uh, reliciation can be uh, reused. Yeah. So light recycling is a way to do a few cycles and 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 reduce environmental impact. So generally, I envision uh, the future uh, would look like this. So you would have uh, a sustainable economy with with a closed material cycle. Uh, and by that I mean not just carbon, because uh, carbon, of course, is the biggest uh, atmospheric uh, pollute, but uh, pollution is also a vector. So we have uh, plastics, uh, we have heavy metals, uh, we have all kinds of persistent pollutants uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. And uh, ideally, uh, an electrified economy uh, would have everything closed. Uh, so all the fluorine and all the cobalt should stay uh, within uh, this infrastructure. So what I envision is uh, we would have battery system, uh, not just cells, but uh, packs uh, that cost uh, something like $100 per kilowatt hour. And we can run them for 20,000 cycles. And then we can do this kind of a shallow recycling where we only add a bit of carbon and oxygen but we have closed loop for these. Uh, some are toxic and, and some are uh, 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 not as earth abundant elements. And using this, uh, we can uh, drive uh, storage of solar and wind uh, combined with nuclear base load and, and use that to drive our, our whole economy. And of course, the shallow recycling, uh, you may be able to do it uh, a few times. Uh, eventually, we may also do uh, like a pyrometallurgical way to do a deep recycling. And in that case, uh, we can achieve uh, unlimited cycles. And this uh, infrastructure that's being put up by the electric vehicle industry, uh, I think I think is going to be the next big thing uh, for, uh, for the battery uh, uh, storage. So, uh, uh, in light of that, uh, we're also organizing uh, conferences at MIT called the A plus B, e, uh, Applied Energy Conference. And so A uh, basically says, you know, what we have to do before uh, 2050. According to the IPCC report um, in 2018, we really have to uh, have our carbon emission uh, by 2040. Otherwise, uh, there will be uh, disastrous effects uh, in both land and ocean, and, and it would be irreversible damage. And so uh, we have to consider uh, technologies which are scalable. Uh, Uh, so uh, uh, we also need to uh, uh, consider, uh, so this is a, a technology A part. Uh, does that sound good enough? So, QA. Okay, what I can do is maybe I can log out and read in again. Uh, just see. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just yeah, the audio. audio. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Try it again. Try it again. Could be a, a connectivity oh. issue. No, go again. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Keep. Did you change mic inputs? Yes, I did. Keep it on this. Okay. Try this. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, so, uh, so this conference that I organized uh, last year, uh, all the talks are put on YouTube. You're welcome to take a look. And uh, this year, uh, we had planned uh, to happen in August, uh, but unfortunately, uh, because of the COVID situation, uh, even though MIT is restarting uh, next week. Uh, this uh, conference is now going on Zoom, uh, which actually is good because uh, now we have an uh, even lower carbon footprint. People don't need to fly in anymore. So it's going to take, take place uh, in August uh, on Zoom. 
Okay, so, uh, and, and in this, I think uh, risk of batteries and, and battery management systems uh, is, is obviously a, a very key topic uh, that we need to solve uh, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So uh, I'm going to then dive into my own research. And, and so in my group, uh, we work on trying to iterate from the basic mechanisms and, and models to uh, developing new battery materials and even to uh, better battery management systems. So uh, I will focus on the cathode, uh, especially on this uh, issue of using uh, cheap anions such as uh, oxygen to contribute capacity uh, for the cathode. Generally, uh, you know, the, what we have uh, in current lithium batteries rely on redox of these four elements, uh, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel. Uh, now, uh, cobalt and nickel are pretty uh, expensive and they're also toxic. Uh, and also they're pretty heavy. Uh, whereas uh, using anions, so as lithium gets in and out, to compensate for the charge, uh, they're much cheaper. Uh, these are generally a few cents per pound and oxygen is basically free. Uh, uh, would improve uh, your gravimetric uh, energy density and also what I call the dollar metric energy densities. Uh, so, uh, uh, however, they have a whole range of issues. So uh, a typical example is the so-called lithium air battery. Now, lithium air battery uh, generally have a very high uh, uh, round trip loss. So uh, the voltage uh, in charge and discharge uh, has a big difference. Uh, and that generally heat, uh, so heat uh, uh, conduction is a big problem. Uh, there is a bad cycle life because of issues of shuttling, uh, self-discharge, uh, low density, uh, and also uh, a low density cause a low volumetric energy density, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of sort of a practical problems that prevented from utilizing these uh, excellent uh, theoretical properties. And uh, in lithium air battery, for example, uh, we have to have, uh, because of this big over potential, uh, and the reason for this over potential is you have phase transformation from condensed matter to uh, gas phase. And, and that involves a huge density difference and, and the hysteresis in the phase transformation. And that generates a lot of heat, uh, which uh, actually uh, limit uh, your charging rate, for example. That's a very practical problem. And the second problem is the uh, lithium air battery uh, essentially is, is a fuel cell. You need the membranes uh, to uh, actually keep all these uh, other things other than oxygen out from the system. So the auxiliary system that you need uh, is actually much heavier uh, than your active material. So this reduces your system uh, economy. Now, uh, one idea that uh, we've been uh, constantly thinking about is in, in rockets, uh, you have uh, hydrogen fuels, uh, but you also bring these uh, perchlorates and, and, and these oxidants, right? Because in, obviously in outer space, there is no gaseous oxygen. And so we're always thinking, is it possible to get uh, electrochemical activity out of these uh, solid oxidants? Uh, so we've even tried to get uh, uh, basically electrochemical activity out of bleach. Uh, uh, and, and it turns out that uh, in sulfur, uh, you can definitely do that. So uh, we've uh, written a paper with uh, Professor Yunhui Huang, um, starting with uh, this lithium sulfide. So in this case, uh, the anode doesn't have to be lithium metal. We can be uh, graphite or, or silicon. And in that case, uh, we can have uh, the system which start out uh, uh, with a lithiated system and we uh, always uh, 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 charge uh, the, the system first. So unlike the typical uh, uh, lithium sulfur batteries. So we just basically uh, try to do the same thing uh, for this, except that uh, we want to start from uh, lithium oxide and we want to uh, uh, basically delithiate it to lithium peroxide and even delisiate it to uh, lithium superoxide. But what we don't want to do is we just want to stop here and we don't want to go to lithium zero uh, O2 because uh, this is a gas. 
whereas these uh, could still be uh, solid or uh, they're still dissolved uh, in the electrolyte. So that, that was the idea and uh, uh, Zhu, uh, uh, uh still uh, a postdoc in my group, he was able to, by making the system uh, in a nanoscale mix system, he was able to create a lot of these interfaces and these interfaces currently uh, serve as, as catalyst and they also stabilize uh, this superoxide which theoretically uh, does not, uh, is not stable as a bulk phase. So uh, we're able to reduce uh, the over potential from more than one volt uh, to about 0.3 volt uh, between charge and discharge. And, uh, uh, and this actually has very good uh, rate capability, intrinsic rate capability. So uh, if we uh, charge at about 10 C, uh, then uh, we do start to release oxygen, uh, which is something uh, we want to avoid. Uh, but uh, if we charge at something like uh, 4C, uh, then, uh, then uh, uh, actually there, there, this is the charge voltage. It doesn't go, go up again, and, and we can stabilize the system with no oxygen release. Uh, so uh, this result uh, was recently uh, uh, scaled up uh, by a very impressive work from uh, uh, Japan and, and Nanjing University where uh, they've shown uh, using uh, iridium uh, catalyst, uh, they can reduce the over potential to uh, only 0.12 uh, volt and they can cycle up to 2000 cycles. And they have also verified uh, that uh, there is uh, lithium superoxide uh, at the end of, of charge. So uh, 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 just uh, this week, uh, we've seen uh, uh, this uh, pouch cell result uh, from the same group uh, where they've made a five mp hour pouch cell uh, with uh, initial uh, energy density be, uh, higher than 500 watt hour per kilogram and uh, uh, I think even down to uh, 100 cycles, uh, they can still uh, keep about 400 watt hour per, 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 per kilogram. So this is the uh, pouch cell uh, charge, uh, uh, this is the half cell, but they have shown the pouch cell charge discharge curve uh, uh, um, in, in their paper. So uh, this is a pure uh, uh, anion redox. So basically the goal is to have essentially a, a sealed uh, lithium oxygen battery and avoid uh, O2, uh, but going to uh, uh, peroxide and, and superoxide and cycle between these uh, condensed phases. So this is uh, what I call the solid oxygen uh, strategy. So it's just like a solid sulfur strategy. So this is trying to do the same thing uh, to, to stabilize uh, oxygen anion redox. So with that, uh, I've shown that uh, you can have, uh, uh, Professor Cho's group have shown you can have very good cyclability and, and reduce the, the round trip loss. Next, I want to show that uh, by doing other tricks, uh, you can improve the compressed density and you have higher volumetric energy density. So this is uh, doing a work on, on sulfur and in this case, hybridizing uh, the pure anion redox of sulfur uh, and also a conversion reaction with uh, intercalation uh, uh, and, and, and also some cation redox uh, in, in, in this mixed composite system. So this is what I call a hybrid anion a cation redox uh, activated as hacker uh, castle uh, concept. So in this case, uh, uh, we're mixing uh, uh, traditional sulfur, which is uh, low conductivity and uh, high porosity and actually pretty bad in terms of uh, making slurry uh, coatings, uh, has pretty bad rheological properties. It's very difficult to have high compressed density in the system with this very hard, very dense uh, intercalation type uh, molysulfide, uh, which uh, contribute uh, this much capacity and actually has a pretty decent uh, volumetric energy density because of the high uh, ideal density. So we're mixing them uh, with, uh, with sulfur-8 and, 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 and this composite 
uh, is able to achieve a very high loading. So uh, we can get uh, uh, something like a 12 milligram of this 50-50% uh, mix, and we can do a hard compression on this composite to only 120 microns. Uh, in contrast to uh, if you just use this much sulfur, uh, you cannot do hard calendaring and you can only have a, a, a thickness which is uh, actually thicker than this. So we actually have this extra material, uh, but still uh, even a, a lower uh, a thickness. And so we can get uh, uh, in the system uh, six uh, milliampere hour per centimeter squared uh, uh, area capacity if we do something like a 0.1 C uh, charge discharge. And, uh, and this is a, 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 a very high loading system. And also uh, uh, we can use very lean uh, electrolytes. So uh, in this case, uh, we only use uh, 1.2 uh, milliliter uh, microgram of, of, of cathode material. So uh, we can end up with uh, uh, something like uh, 360 watt hour per kilogram. And this is still using uh, a very small pouch cell. So with bigger pouch cell, we should be able to hit 400, uh, but then a uh, uh, volumetric energy density, which is uh, close to 600 watt, uh, per uh, watt hour per liter. Okay, so, uh, so we are also uh, thinking to do this uh, with oxygen. And uh, the best known system uh, for oxygen uh, anion redox uh, and cation redox, so the best known system is this over dissiated, uh, this uh, magnet rich. Uh, uh, metal oxide. So on the technology roadmap, uh, so uh, currently we are doing uh, 62, so that's industrialized uh, NCM, so nickel, cobalt, manganese, uh, 811 is, is close to industrialization. Uh, but the next step uh, in the process would be uh, using this over dissipated oxide, uh, so 14% lithium that's replacing the manganese. Uh, uh, sorry, replacing the transition metal, the transition metal layer. Uh, and also for the anode, we're going to have uh, going from the pure graphite to a graphite with silicon. And of course, uh, due to silicon having a, a very high volume expansion uh, and, and, and generally bad columbic efficiency, you also need to uh, do some pre-dissiation uh, of, of the silicon anode. And, and recently, uh, there's a lot of good work uh, in this area uh, from, for example, University of Maryland, uh, Professor Chen Wang, Wang, and, and, and I uh, uh, will talk a little bit about this at the end. So uh, but we're going to uh, talk about uh, the over the system. And the general problem is, is the following. Uh, so if you replace the transition metal uh, by an lithium atom, then you create this uh, lithium oxygen lithium uh, axis, which has been shown to create, uh, to elevate the oxygen level. So uh, you're gonna have this oxygen P orbital that's less covalently bonded and more ionically bonded. And, and the result is you're going to shift up uh, the oxygen density uh, state upward. And that uh, make you easier to use uh, the oxygen redox at a uh, little bit above four volt. Uh, so, uh, and you're going to be able to use uh, the oxygen capacity together with the transition metal capacity. But there is a catch, which is that anytime you convert uh, the typical oxide uh, to peroxide, uh, the migration barrier for this oxygen greatly reduces. So this is uh, a work uh, from Professor Persong uh, in, in 2014. Uh, it's a DF modeling that shows that when you go from uh, oxide, which has a migration barrier of 2.3 to 4 EV2 peroxide, the migration barrier drops up to 0.9 EV. And uh, that means you can basically move uh, at the room temperature. And so uh, oxygen redox, uh, therefore, is intrinsically risky. It is an asset, 
uh, that you can use, uh, but uh, it comes with the following problems. Uh, when you have oxygen that's going to reconfigure, so it's going to uh, migrate a little bit on the order of nanometers, so that we believe uh, this local oxygen mobility is unavoidable. Uh, uh, it's kind of similar to the situation with sulfur, uh, uh, that, uh, that you have motion of uh, this oxidized uh, oxide. Uh, but the more, uh, the bigger problem is actually if this local oxygen mobility, if they percolate, uh, then uh, you can have global oxygen mobility all the way uh, to the surface. And if they go to the surface, uh, they are going to escape and uh, burn your electrolyte. And actually, your electrolyte is the most precious resource uh, in many situations. Uh, in industry, very often you use something like uh, two grams of electrolyte per ampere hour, uh, and and you're going to show that you know this electrolyte weight is actually um, only forty percent of your cathode weight. So if this oxygen reacts with electrolyte, uh, it's very bad. And also, uh, if it escapes, you're going to have auction vacancy, and this auction vacancy actually drives further uh, reconfiguration, further mobility, and you have a collapse of your layered structure from the surface, and this collapse is not a self-passivating process. So for example, there is recent work uh, that shows uh, that you have all these cavities that develop uh, in these over state oxides, and associated with that, uh, uh, it's this voltage drop uh, and, and, and reaction with the electrolyte. So uh, what we have done is trying to reverse uh, the trend. So knowing that replacing transition metal by lithium uh, elevate the oxygen energy level, if we do the reverse, uh, we actually uh, move transition. If we have more transition metal elements in the lithium layer, actually create this lithium poor surface, uh, then uh, we can protect the surface oxygen. So that's the main idea. And in the core, you're still going to have local oxygen mobility because we think uh, that is just unavoidable if you try to use oxygen's uh, intrinsic capacity. But uh, we try to shut off the global oxygen migration uh, 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 by, by, by modifying the surface. And the way we, we do that, uh, so this is the, the band diagram. So in the core, uh, we're going to use uh, these cobalt and nickel uh, redox capacity. So these are transition metal uh, redox, which are safe assets. But we're also going to use uh, oxygen redox uh, quite significantly, actually contributes theoretically up to this much uh, contributions. Uh, whereas on the surface, uh, because we have uh, this uh, uh, transition metal replacing the lithium, we elevate, we elevate uh, the Fermi energy and, 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 and make sure it does not touch uh, the oxygen band. So the way we do that is uh, we use uh, a molten uh, oxide, uh, the uh, molybdenum oxide, and that basically sucks out uh, uh, lithium monoxide uh, from the surface. Uh, and furthermore, uh, this reaction product uh, is also uh, completely wetting the surface, it even goes to grain boundaries, and it's also water soluble. So you just wash it, and then uh, your secondary particle breaks up into these uh, standalone 200 nanometer uh, primary particles. So uh, we can have this continuous gradient uh, from uh, this richness uh, inside. Uh, to least importance uh, on the surface. And evidence uh, is this. So uh, in the core, uh, if actually it's not very deep, uh, this is just like uh, 10 monolayers from the surface, just uh, about uh, 10 nanometers going into the surface. Here uh, in the lithium layer, you don't see anything uh, 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 because uh, this is fully occupied by lithium. Uh, but as you go to the surface, uh, you start to see uh, these faint uh, transitional occupation. So that's uh, proof that uh, we have lithium poor 
surface is because transition metal, which have TM contrast, is occupying I mean, the lithium layer. Here we have uh, lithium uh, occupying the transition metals, but you cannot see them. Uh, uh, so in the TEM. So uh, with that, uh, we can show that uh, indeed we have this elevated uh, transition metal occupation on the surface and from uh, synchrotron, we can also verify the valence is, is reduced. Uh, and, and, and with that, uh, we can have uh, reduced uh, voltage decay uh, uh, at the point 1C. And even at the 1C, uh, we can have uh, 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 stable cycling uh, at 100 cycles. So uh, we have made uh, full cells uh, with uh, only, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, two gram of electrolyte. Uh, per empty hour, uh, and 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 that full cell is 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 shown to work uh, decently. And finally, uh, these are the morphologies of the particles. So we don't have uh, secondary particles. We have these uh, round cornered uh, uh, primary particles, and the compressed density is already close uh, to three gram per cc. So uh, uh, it's actually already have a pretty decent. Uh, volumetric uh, energy density. So even at uh, 200 cycles, uh, the cathode uh, 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 and energy density is, is, is close to 850 uh, watt hour per kilogram. And also using a similar gradient approach, uh, we're able to uh, also uh, uh, modify the surface of lithium copper oxide. So in this case, uh, we just use commercial lithium copper oxide uh, single crystals. So these are 10 micron size of commercial powders and single crystals. And we uh, do a very simple uh, gradient treatment and, and we can charge to uh, 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 up to 4.6 volt now. And, and it has uh, 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 about 3,000 watt hour per per liter cathode uh, capacity even uh, after 300 cycles. So this is the uh, 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 volumetric uh, uh, energy density. So uh, those are the, the main things uh, that we've done uh, on the cathode things, on the cathode side. There is also quite a bit of uh, liquid electrolyte development, uh, which I don't have time to go into uh, today uh, in collaboration with uh, Pro Professor Jeremiah Johnson and uh, Professor Yang Xiaohorn. Uh, on the anode side, I just want to briefly talk about uh, lithium metal anode. Uh, now, uh, uh, Recently, we've shown that at room temperature, uh, you can use the uh, cobalt creep of lithium metal, which is you can drive uh, the motion of uh, body center cubic lithium phase uh, in these tubules. And these tubules cannot be uh, too thin, uh, sorry, cannot be, uh, uh, the wall cannot be too thin. And also because uh, it cannot sustain the mechanical stress, and also the diameter uh, is at the optimal uh, size of about 100 nanometers. And this kind of system is able to wick uh, lithium metal up and down, almost like a liquid uh, uh, at room temperature, just by uh, electrochemical driving force in an all solid state battery. Uh, so uh, this is uh, in the end, uh, evidence of this, so we are showing a single in hollow tubule. So what you see inside of this pretty faint contrast uh, is lithium metal, and we're cycling for 100 cycles. Uh, so this is accelerated uh, video showing 100 cycles uh, in good integrity uh, in the tubule. And to slow it down a bit, uh, this is the big situation. So on, uh, on this side uh, is the solid electrolyte. And on this side is a current collector, and we are increasing the voltage. And in this case, our battery is seen, uh, uh, in place. So, this uh, faceting uh, of the lithium uh, metal. So, you can, can, you, can, 
Ju, can you turn your, just do a quick mic check again really quick. It just got a little scratchy again. Sorry for the interruption. How about now? Better, thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, actually uh, what is very curious is uh, uh, this move as a single crystal. So this is not a liquid. Uh, you can see the faceting. Uh, it actually is uh, a single crystal uh, with a specific crystal orientation along the axial direction. Uh, and so we use, uh, uh, in this case, still a very primitive uh, uh, polymer uh, solid electrolytes that's actually very thick. And we're able to uh, make an all solid state battery uh, that cycle for 50 cycles uh, with an over P ratio of one uh, with uh, lithium iron phosphate. So uh, this is on the side of uh, all solid state batteries. Uh, I think this is still, uh, there's still a lot that need to be done uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this area. Uh, but this is kind of scientifically interesting of using uh, not just solid electrolyte, but also mixed ionic electronic conductors. And also it turns out to maintain the mechanical stability, you also need something which is uh, neither an electron conductor nor a lithium ion conductor called the electron lithium ion uh, insulator. You need all four kinds of solids, metal, solid electrolyte, Eli, and the MIG uh, to make an all solid state battery work. So uh, lastly, I want to talk about silicon anode material. And I just want to quickly uh, wrap up. Uh, so uh, this is actually uh, some earlier work. Uh, what we've shown is uh, together with Professor Yi Tui is you can actually get a Coulombic efficiency uh, with a silicon uh, anode uh, to 3.9 or even to 4.9. So this is what you need uh, for long cycle life. Uh, this and the low volume expansion is what you need for long cycle life. And in fact, uh, the, the, the way you achieve this kind of high columbic efficiency uh, is by self healing. Uh, because traditionally these uh, systems, uh, these nano systems, uh, they consume a lot of electrolyte. Uh, they also consume a lot of uh, lithium. Uh, but what we are curious about is after the initial formation, after uh, uh, the initial cycling, uh, can you reach uh, a columbic efficiency that can be used for grid scale storage or not? Because to cycle for several thousand cycles, you need better than 99.99% uh, columbic efficiency. So uh, what we found is that that's actually indeed possible. So what we have done here is we're plotting this columbic inefficiency, which is one minus uh, the columbic efficiency and we're plotting in log scale. So uh, this is 99% uh, uh, columbic efficiency. This is 99.9%. And actually we've hit the uh, instrument re resolution, which is 99.99%. And actually sometimes we get 100.01% uh, in our reading. Uh, so we sort of reach the resolution of, of, of our instrument. Uh, but uh, it is actually possible by a careful design of the nanostructure system to uh, theoretically reach uh, this kind of very high columbic uh, efficiency. So that's very, very, very close uh, to one. And, uh, but in the initial training of the system, uh, you need to spend quite a lot of lithium. So you need to spend uh, maybe up to 50% uh, of your cathode or your anode capacity to, uh, to form these uh, self-healed systems. And that's why uh, you need a uh, uh, in the system. And as I mentioned before, this is a key technology uh, that is needed to achieve uh, long cycle life for uh, grid scale uh, battery uh, storage. So I would uh, stop here and uh, welcome uh, questions. Apologies for uh, the bad sound uh, at the beginning. Now we can uh, start and uh, asking questions. Uh, uh, when I'm uh, uh, asking Professor Lee with uh, uh, the questions already uh, posted there, so please uh, ask and uh, your uh, post your questions on the Q and A uh, uh, dialogue box. 
uh, let me start asking questions the uh, Professor Li uh, uh, may not touch too much, but the, the questions are still pretty uh, interesting and uh, important there. Uh, here we go. One question from uh, uh, our one of our uh, very enthusiastic and, uh, attendee uh, regarding the BMS system. So with your new application of uh, material science to improve the performance and uh, durability of uh, battery cells, is there, uh, is there demand for new BMS either adjusting the hardware and or software of uh, existing systems to accommodate the new battery uh, properties? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, so uh, a lot can be done uh, on, at the pack level and on the, uh, on the both the hardware and on the software aspects. So uh, in terms of sensors, uh, uh, there we are doing some work on uh, using uh, acoustic emission, using sound uh, combined with uh, machine learning uh, and synchrotron studies to uh, be a, a cheap and fast diagnostic of what happens inside the battery. Uh, and also in terms of temperature estimation, uh, because uh, I showed the fire accidents. So a lot of times uh, the interior of the battery, you can have hot spots that have reached 200 degrees, but on the outside is still cold. So there are precious time that's lost uh, in this thermal runaway uh, situation, which you can diagnose uh, both from the uh, current voltage relation and also from better sensors uh, that you can develop. Uh, and also uh, uh, on the state of health and on the uh, life prediction part, uh, uh, there can be a lot that can be done with uh, deep neural networks. So uh, there's uh, excellent work uh, from Stanford, uh, Will True, and uh, here uh, from uh, MIT, uh, uh, Martin Bazant and, and uh, 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 Richard uh, uh, group. So they, uh, uh, they've shown, uh, uh, they've opened uh, up a lot of the data for battery cycling. But what we've shown is that uh, by uh, training uh, better data models, you can uh, get even better performance uh, in, in live prediction. So this is uh, a key area. Remember, going from the cell to the pack, uh, you lose about a half uh, in uh, volumetric energy density. So a lot can be done uh, at the pack level. So uh, if you're interested, uh, we, we should uh, uh, you know, talk in, in private on, on this. Okay. Uh, so following that question, <clears throat> we, the, there's the other question uh, highly related to the first question. It, it is uh, to battery safety or prolonged uh, life, which initiative is in battery position, like uh, reduce the overheating? Yeah, you definitely don't want overheating. Uh, that is, uh, 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 that, that is, I mean, safety is, is always number one. Uh, but interestingly, uh, sometimes heating the battery, for example, uh, in cold weather, uh, is, is necessary to start up the, the, uh, the battery from uh, cold weather. And also sometimes uh, active heating could also be a way to improve the rate capability. But uh, if you have both high temperature and high voltage, uh, that can reduce the, the cell life. And you definitely don't want to have a thermal runaway situation. So uh, there needs to be smart software that, uh, and the sensors uh, that, uh, uh, under, I mean, that diagnose the uh, interior temperature and also control the temperature. And you can also have active cooling in the system. So uh, uh, all these are, are, are really uh, a key. Uh, parameters for uh, long-term stability uh, and performance of the battery. It's a very good question. Okay. 
Well, let me, uh, uh, I found that there, there's one question from uh, one audience, I believe, but you may want to pay uh, some attention. Uh, he asked if you ha could uh, have uh, some time to explain more uh, self-heating uh, mechanism. If you could uh, in, in the, say something more there or? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, that's probably uh, related to my, uh, is it anode. self? Yeah, yeah, okay. Silicon anode. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, there is always a self-healing in, uh, in battery. So the formation of this uh, passivation layer called the solid electrolyte interface uh, it is an attempt of the system to self-heal. But generally, the SCI is pretty fragile. So uh, uh, we generally think of the SCI as kind of like a mud. And we need to give a stronger structural support. Uh, and also that uh, structural support, uh, for example, like this uh, three-dimensional anode, uh, lithium uh, metal containing anode that I've shown, uh, is uh, also have good adhesion with uh, your SCI. So uh, there is a lot of mechanical design uh, in self-healing. And I think the way in the future, uh, the way of the future is a three-dimensional architecture uh, electrodes. So for example, right now, if you use lithium metal, it's just a thin foil. It's just a, a roll down uh, basic foil. It's two-dimensional. I think in the future, uh, you will definitely have three-dimensional percolating mesh or honeycomb in a system that provide electronic percolation no matter what happens inside. And also, uh, uh, currently, uh, a lot of the powder uh, anodes are basically unstructured. I think they will become more and more uh, organized and, and three-dimensional architecture in the future. So we are actually already doing quite a lot of work uh, as shown in that uh, nature paper in that direction. Okay. Uh, one question uh, also asking uh, about uh, slow charging is a, a big problem for in EV application of the lithium ion batteries. Any potential material solution on that uh, horizon? Yeah. So currently uh, uh, the charging rate is limited by the graphite. Uh, if you do fast charge, uh, especially uh, when you go to high battery voltage, you're going to have uh, lithium metal uh, pre precipitation. Uh, so there are two ways. You can go to uh, hard carbon, uh, which elevates the potential and diffi more difficult to uh, come out as, as lithium metal. Uh, or you can use uh, niobium-based uh, oxides, which are replacing uh, lithium titanate, titanium based, pure titanium based systems as uh, high rate uh, anodes. So those are on the material side. Um, but there is also a lot you can do on the BMS side. So recently, for example, uh, Tesla, three minutes before uh, it arrived at the fast charging station, it actively heat up uh, the battery pack. So that uh, when you do the fast charge, when you arrive at the fast charger, uh, you can do a higher rate fast charge without precipitating lithium. Uh, but you need to be, have a very good uh, uh, BMS in that case because uh, when you go charge with high voltage, it becomes uh, very bad for the life of the battery pack. So uh, fast charging for both uh, consumer electronics and for uh, electric vehicles and even for grid scale is, is a key issue. And, and, and there, there is a lot that can be done both from material side and from the BMS side. Great. Okay. There is one more question, uh, well, two more questions. Well, I would ask this one. For the mentioned uh, detection me method, is it uh, decided for laboratory di diagnostics or it is uh, designed to be part of uh, BMS? And also, would vibration uh, uh, on application will affect the accuracy of uh, diagnostics? That's a great question. So, uh, so in acoustic emission, we have different frequency uh, bands. So, uh, 
I think uh, we're capturing some signatures which are uh, outside of the standard vibration, car vibration frequency range. And also uh, what we try to do with machine learning is we try to use uh, cheap sensors, uh, uh, use the more expensive data to train cheap sensor data. Uh, and that's a way to be able to bring uh, the lab uh, diagnostic to the, to the commercial realm of the BMS. Okay. Well, the last so Using question. machine learning, we can, we can basically train proxy models and, and cheaper sensors. Okay. Okay. Last question. This is the uh, very uh, quite an uh, uh, interesting one is, uh, so what are the main challenges and uh, potential breakthroughs for lithium ion batteries uh, in the next five years? Uh, great question. So uh, I think uh, uh, I'm going to give this MIT A plus B answer because I think there are two kinds of uh, main and, and, and potential challenges. So for A, which is actions, right? So we have to take climate action. Uh, in that aspect, uh, recycling uh, and improving safety uh, are the key challenges if lithium ion batteries to make an impact on, on climate change uh, and, and renewable energy. And, and those are uh, more uh, engineering challenges. Uh, but for the B aspect, which is what we will use after, let's say 2040, uh, uh, what are the new science that's going to come out? Then I think uh, definitely uh, this uh, hybrid anion and cation redox on the cathode side. So if we can uh, utilize more of the anion redox, uh, even though it's a risky asset, but if we can use them well and have good cycle life, uh, then that will greatly improve uh, the dollar metric uh, energy density because those do not use cobalt or nickel. Uh, we're going to remove a big resource limitation for least amount of batteries. Uh, and also, uh, 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 on, the, on the anode side, I think for sure, uh, we're gonna have more and more silicon uh, mixed into graphite. Uh, we will have better electrolytes. And uh, the holy grail is the lithium metal uh, anode. And so I think those would also happen uh, scientifically, uh, very actively investigating in the next five years. But I don't think those would uh, immediately make impact for climate change. For climate change, we have already all the basic uh, material chemistry we need. Uh, uh, we just need a better recycling and, and better software uh, to actually uh, break into this uh, uh, electrical grid market, which is several times the size of electric vehicle market. Well, uh, that's great. Well, with that, uh, thank you so much, Professor Lee. Uh, for the excellent talk, which is very inspiring and informative and relevant. So hi everyone, thank you for your attention. This in concludes our session today. There will be a short survey when you leave this web webinar se session. We appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Thanks everyone. See you at the next session on June 18th. Bye-bye. Stay Thanks. healthy. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay healthy.